Dell Technologies Podference After Show. I'm your host, Jill Schlesinger from the Jill on Money Podcast. All right. I think that every day I'm going to really try hard to make this disclaimer exciting and inviting or maybe scary. But here goes. This video meeting may be live streamed via the internet or one or more social media platforms and may be recorded and played back in portions or in its entirety by Odyssey, Group M, or Dell on Air on their websites and social media pages. So by participating in this video meeting, you are consenting to the use and distribution of the video meeting, including your image, likeness, statements, and actions. And if you do not consent, you must leave the meeting now. If you engage in any inappropriate activity or behavior during the video meeting, you may be removed from the video meeting with or without notice. And that would be terrible because we've got such a great after show today. We are going to be talking about the unique challenges that small businesses have confronted amid a once in a generation pandemic and how they are adapting to a post COVID world. Sometimes we're talking about origin stories. Today, I guess we have a Lone Star show. That's what I'm going to call it. We have the famous, legendary David Brown. He is a former anchor of the National Public Radio Business Program Marketplace. He's a veteran public radio journalist. He's currently host and managing editor of the Texas Standard, which is a daily hour-long news program heard on public radio stations across the aforementioned Lone Star State. He's also the host of the Business Wars podcast. Also joining us is Aaron Welker. He is Strategic Programs Lead, Small Business Marketing uh, at Dell Technologies. Aaron leads the marketing efforts for specific groups or small businesses that are considered to be some of the most important for both the growth of business and the overall goal of advancing human progress, including startups and entrepreneurs. So, Gentlemen, welcome to the after show. It's great to have you both. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, and, Joe. Looking and let's go with David. Tell me a little bit about the episode that you hosted for this podference. Um, it's it's an interesting discussion of 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 a small business that all of a sudden, um, or two small businesses that that all of a sudden seem to be getting very big out of nowhere. So tell those stories <laughs> for us in a thumbnail. Well, you know, they did seem to, everyone always seems to come from nowhere until you know the backstory. And I think that's one of the reasons that I really enjoy Business Wars because we do dig into some of the backstories of some of these really big names. And I think these two are no exception. Uh, Domino's Pizza, right? I mean, it's been around forever, it seems. But once upon a time, you had a guy named Tom Monahan who was living in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and he was trying to get a pizza, uh, uh, basically a pizza restaurant off the ground. And uh, he expanded, but it seemed like he was constantly running into problems. And by the way, this is a pretty consistent um, uh, thing that happens to entrepreneurs. Uh, you do hit failure quite a lot. But I mean, Tom faced so much. He uh, had a small chain, hand-to-mouth operation. His brother bailed. His, his business partner ripped him off. His, his old headquarters burned down. And his creditors are on his back. And so you look at those you know, factors and you say, how do you then turn into a multinational corporation with the scale and size and scope and success of Domino's Pizza today. And I think that's a, it's a fascinating story. And you can say the same thing for Columbia. Talk about an unlikely success story. Uh, you, you know, the, the, uh, uh, this is a story of an old, uh, an old sportswear company uh, that uh, was run by Gert Boyle's husband. He passed away, leaving Gert, uh, who was at that point a, a, a housewife with, with kids, leaving her with this business. Everyone wants to take advantage of her. Employees are talking behind her back. The mm -hmm. bankers want to close her down, you know. But she basically, uh, by, uh, by refusing to accept no for an answer, by refusing to allow her company to go down, uh, she brings it back up and turns it also into a multinational success story. Um, and I'm inspired by these entrepreneurs because even though, of course, Gert Boyle sort of inherited literally 
uh, Columbia Sportswear. She turned it into what it is today. Um, and Domino's, of course, is, is a fabulous success story, becoming number one, beating Pizza Hut at its own game for the first time uh, worldwide in, in 2018. Um, I'm inspired by their stories, and it's, it's fun to get to share them. Aaron, I wonder if in your role, if these kinds of stories pop up um, as you see them, that people find themselves to be uh, almost accidental entrepreneurs. I think some of the stories that we hear about, oh, I wanted to be an entrepreneur from, you know, when I was two years old selling apples on the street or whatever they did or lemonade. But a lot of times, really interesting businesses form um, without someone necessarily having the idea that it would be what it becomes. So can you talk a little bit about that experience and one of the common traits that you see in some of these folks? Sure. I think that it's such a, it's such a good point. And, and I think the reality is, is that every, every entrepreneur to some degree probably has a story somewhat like this where there was uh, massive hurdles. Uh, to take the example of, of uh, Tom Monahan, like every single one of those hurdles would have been a great excuse to quit. Like none of us would have looked at him and said, oh, you're a failure or you're a quitter or anything like that. We'd have said, no, that was that was about the right time to quit, you know? <laughs> so, and I think every entrepreneur has a, has a similar story where there's just constant hurdles. And in talking with uh, entrepreneurs here over the past couple of weeks and, uh, and diving into things like how do they make IT decisions and things like that. The number one trait that's rising to the top is it's frustrating. It's nerve wracking. It's, it's difficult. And so from the Dell technology side, being able to walk with entrepreneurs uh, through that journey in just a small way and, and contribute to their business success in, again, just a small way but an area where it can be an area of such frustration, such challenge, um, it's, it's a really rewarding experience and something that I'm, I'm proud, to be, uh, proud to be a part of here. You know, I, I'm interested, David, as you cover these, um, these companies and you know, these two in particular, um, you're a bit of a voyeur, that's what journalists do. Sure. Um, have you felt the pull, the entrepreneurial pull, or are you just get excited by the stories? I, of course. I mean, it's hard not to listen to these stories and feel that pull because in many respects, uh, these folks are heroes. I mean, they're um, changing the world with, uh, with ideas big and small. And so it's hard not to want to be a part of that, of course. But uh, it's safer, uh, you know, to be on the sidelines and, and to talk about it. Um, but I think, too, that, that uh, one of the things when we started doing the Business Wars podcast, we've now done about 300 different episodes now uh, in the past couple of years. I think one of the things that I really appreciate as a journalist is the lessons that are to be learned. And we had not really in the podcast delved into the lessons. We, we do that now in The Art of Business Wars, which is the new book that's based around the podcast. We try to extract some of these lessons and we're using Sun Tzu, you know, The Art of War as a kind of conceit to explore some of these things. But I think Aaron is, is really hitting on something that's absolutely crucial. We often talk about in, in business, domain knowledge and first mover advantage and all of these things. And, and a lot of people will start a business because they have domain knowledge. If it were me, I might want to start, I don't know, a, a, a podcast or a media company because that's where my domain knowledge is. But quite often we find that um, we have to wing it from time to time, that domain knowledge isn't enough. And you see that quite often in these stories. You see people basically having to rely on their intuition. But, you know, the best corporate stories are seldom the real story, right? I mean, if you, if you look at the official corporate histories of a lot of successful companies, you'll find that there's a whole lot more struggle that went into it than some are willing to admit because it does come across as kind of failure. I think that one of the key um, one of the key uh, uh, aspects that you find uh, in, in every single entrepreneur, every single one of these stories is a kind of refusal to give up. I mean, these business leaders had many, many more downs than ups. And that's certainly the case uh, for Tom uh, Monahan and, and, and Gert Boyle here. You know, I, I'm interested also in not only are a lot of these people you know, accidental entrepreneurs, but they start overseeing just 
enormous labor forces and, and workforces, and many of them have very little training in that. That's right. Uh, and and, and I, Aaron, I'm wondering how, how you might see that. I, I know that you have a military background and you know, obviously things were quite different than, you know, when you started and when you end at the rank of captain. What are some of the, the lessons that you draw from the military that you bring to your own experience and that you might see as a common thread with other leaders out there who are really able to marshal their forces, even though it's, you know, obviously it's a workforce, not a military force? You know, two, two things come to, to, come to mind um, offhand. Um, and one of those is, I might butcher this quote a little bit, so apologies on that, is that if you, if you have a great idea and a poor team, you're going to end up with just, you know, nothing, essentially. If you have a poor idea, but a great team, you're going to end up with a great idea because that great team is going to turn that poor idea and make it into something good. They're going to change it and they're going to fix it until it's something good. So just the value of people and the value of uh, having good talent as part of your team, as part of uh, the, the core structure of uh, your startup, your organization at any size, I, I don't think that can be underestimated. Um, so that's, that's kind of thing one. And of course that, that, without a doubt that showed itself through in the military as well. Um, but more of a kind of military specific thing that uh, is starting to get more prominence is uh, this idea of what we would call decentralized uh, command. Of course, uh, Jocko Willick uh, wrote a book that was primarily centered around this idea, but it's, it's taught uh, in, the, in the Marine Corps and other forces as well, this idea that um, you give a team the end state, not necessarily so detailed in the how to, but you give them, here is the end goal that you're working with. You give them the authority and the decision power to go work and you delegate that to them and they, and they go out and do great things. Um, and those are, those are two of those things that um, probably stand out very prominently in the military, but then it are, are applicable across the board, whether you're talking about a large organization like Dell Technologies or whether you're talking um, about a startup that, um, you know, they're, they're working late nights after a job or after their classes trying to get something off the ground for the first time. David, have you seen st the stories when you talk about business wars? I, I, are you actually ever talking to the folks who do fail, who are willing to come on? I know I have a friend who calls this failure porn and he gets very, he's like very weary of it. But you know, many businesses fail and, and you have to have a certain amount of optimism. I think we had the, uh, I think in the first year of the pandemic, we've had a 40% increase of this uh, starting of new businesses from the right. pri prior year. So, I mean, there's a lot of optimistic people, but what about those who fail? What do they, what do they find out or were they unlucky or how to, or, and how do they keep going? Well, you know, one of the things that's unique about business wars is that we really don't focus on the failure. Of course, if you uh, if you consider that in a sense all business is war, I mean you're always sort of competing for an edge in uh, whatever field you're you're in in one way or another. Um, really, these battles can go on for the duration. Uh, you think about Gibson versus Fender, for example, the two guitar giants. Uh, for a long time, Gibson was dominant, and they turned down an opportunity to uh, be first out of the gate with the electric guitar. And they let a, a guy from Fullerton, California, who repaired radios, come up and 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 uh, build the first uh, practical, uh, wide widely used electric guitar with the Fender Telecaster. What would become the Fender Telecaster? You see the same thing with Harley Davidson versus Indian. You know, going way back, and in of course more modern companies, most certainly. I have to say that I would take issue with the idea that it's sort of, you know, disaster porn in a sense, you know, corporate disaster porn, because these are really stories about people who do persist until they really can't. And you do see, I think, as, as Aaron was sort of suggesting here, that it does come down to people, because if you think of the way successful businesses proceed, there's the strategic level and there's the tactical level. And if you're a business owner with an idea and you're trying to grow that idea, you don't have time necessarily, especially in a growing business, to deal with all of the tactics. So you have to recruit a team that you can trust 
to execute those tactics or to even develop those tactics. You have to give them the strategy, trust that they're going to move forward and build from that using sound principles, using their own best judgment. And there's nothing like the joy that comes from building uh, a new business from the ground up and even fighting to retain hold of that uh, ground that you've, uh, that you've succeeded with. So to me, these are all success stories. And that's another characteristic of great business leadership. Uh, failure is never final. That's, uh, you know, and there's, there's a really amazing statistic about the number of, of failed businesses that, um, that many successful entrepreneurs open, close, move to the next one and try, try, try again. I just want to follow up with a question because in your episode, you also had an interview with someone from, the, from Food News Media right. talking a little bit about how Domino's performed during the pandemic. We heard all these great stories about you know, pizza and delivery just soaring. What do you think is the takeaway in this next period of time post-pandemic? Will, will, what will Domino's be able to do to leverage what the company learned during the pandemic and bring it forward? I think Domino's is uniquely well positioned because if you think back to when you first heard of Domino's or some of our you know, listeners first heard of Domino's, um, it was as a delivery pizza service. They weren't, you know, wasn't so much as pizza parlors. And so they really did have a kind of first mover advantage in that space, even though clearly they weren't the only pizza chain in the business and, and Pizza Hut has definitely given them a run for the money. But what Domino's did on a couple of levels, they embraced their weaknesses, which is pizza that didn't taste good, came out with a bold campaign to basically say, yeah, we get it and mm -hmm. to improve on it. Right. So they embraced their weakness and turned it into a strength. Uh, I, th I think uh, one of the things that if you think about dominoes going forward, coming out of this pandemic, they're poised not just to survive, but to thrive because they're already looking at the future of delivery and things like, for instance, uh, remote delivery or uh, uh, it sounds like science fiction, but robotic or drone delivery services. And Domino's has actually experimented with, uh, uh, with uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, for example, uh, making pizza deliveries. And, and because of their market position, they're in, they have a lot of capital built up so that they can actually execute. So you're always thinking success, you know, I said failure is never uh, fatal. Success is never final, right? I mean, that's the other part of that axiom. And so Domino's has continued during this pandemic to push forward with establishing its, its reputation, cementing its reputation as the delivery service for pizza. They're incredibly well poised, I think, more so than their number two rival, Pizza Hut. And I also think that maybe their competition is well beyond Pizza Hut, right? Because oh, yeah, Uber, sure. it's Uber Eats and it's Slice app and all of those, um, those competitors who are leveraging technology. And this brings me back to you, Aaron. I'm just wondering, you know, how you think that the, some of the small businesses that you interacted with throughout the pandemic were able to leverage some technical aspects of their business and, and thrive during the pandemic. So what did you see? So a, a lot of it came down to um, needing, needing to adapt, which I think is, you know, one of the, one of the best things that you can say about the small businesses uh, in America is, is their ability to adapt to uh, whatever the latest challenges are. Um, not all small businesses uh, fared well, um, but many, many did because of their ability to, to adapt to the changing times. So uh, in, in more uh, concrete terms, what that means is um, we had many customers that had to shift, uh, shift their entire operations to remote operations in the matter of a week or two, or it was the end of their business. And being able to be on the fulfillment end of that and meet those and see those success stories was so cool, uh, especially uh, early on in the pandemic. And then what you saw throughout the pandemic is kind of the shifting of business models to adapt um, to the to the changing climate. Uh, so um, just uh, off offhand, thinking of um, restaurants that are now moving into shipping their products across the country in some cases um, to uh, to adapt to these uh, the changing times and everything. Uh, so it's been it's been really interesting to to see that seeing uh, companies growing their infrastructure 
um, adding more to uh, potentially server needs and things like that, in addition to their client systems that are being used, uh, you know, in employees, oftentimes, instead of a, a centralized location, uh, and being able to work with them uh, through that and uh, help them to continue to grow. Yeah, it's been very interesting to see that adaption occurring. Jill, I, if, yes, forgive me for interrupting, but I, I want to I want to piggyback on that because adaptation now has become a way of life for a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of businesses, I think, have been content in trying to grow where they were. But when you're faced with an issue like the pandemic, it becomes about survival. And if in those who successfully adapt can see the world in a different way, if you will, can see what they're doing in a different way. And I think the point that you too made, Joe, when you were talking about Domino's, not just competing against Pizza Hut, but competing against all these other app services and understanding that the competition is bigger. And how can they now reimagine their business? I think it's going to be fascinating to see how some of these well-established brands now pivot to take advantage of what that future is going to be bringing. Yeah. And it's funny because you might have, one might have thought like, oh, Columbia is going to get crushed in a pandemic because right. nobody's going to go do anything and no one's going to buy clothes. And then all of a sudden, the only thing we can do is go outdoors. So can <laughs> you talk a little bit about um, how Columbia basically catapulted its previous success, but actually during the pandemic was a good time for them, right? No question. No question. You know, Columbia's strategy all along has been to go to places where um, others might fear to tread. I'm thinking of the North Face in Patagonia, for example. You know, Columbia has, has never sort of poo-pooed or looked down their noses at those retail opportunities. And that's been an enormous strength for Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that makes Columbia uh, uh, poised for success is that they see these other markets. They see these places where they can get their clothes uh, uh, into the hands of more people. And, and that's, really what it's, that's really what it's all about. It's about reimagining or having the capacity and capability to reimagine yourself in a changed world. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that, again, great leaders have in common. It's the ability to see beyond where we are today. You think of Steve Jobs, right? He's, he's sent in exile. He, he's out of Apple. But when he comes back, he knocks down everything that Apple has been doing except for four computers. Now you might say, well, what on earth, what, what was he doing? Of course, the iPod was yet to be developed, right? The iPhone, of course. What he was doing was he was clearing the landscape so that he could consider the future and position Apple to take advantage of that. And I think we're gonna see a lot more companies doing that in the next year, two, three. Uh, and I think that there's something to be said for there are there are certain practices in your company. It doesn't mean you can't adapt, but there are certain things you just have to do right. And right. since you're both Texans, I must tell you that um, I was able to interview Admiral um, Bill McRaven, who's retired from the U.S. Navy. He wrote that really fabulous book that that came out of his um, graduation speech at uh, University of Texas called Make Your Bed. And I, I like the idea that there are certain things that you do in your life, but also in your business that just kind of give you structure. So I'm wondering what you guys found from the, the structural aspects of the pandemic that helped you personally. Aaron, you want to go first? You're saying good habits that came out of the pandemic? Okay, I now you can. A lot I mean, of bad habits. Okay, <laughs> if, you're, if you're eating a lot and drinking a lot, I understand. Ooh, but yeah. what, no, but the, <laughs> the idea of good habits, how about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, my goodness, I, I feel like we, we talk about it as, as if it was so long ago, but it seems like, you know, something we're still in and something kind of in a, in a strange compressed timeline when you look, at, look back over the, the past several months. Um, so I, yeah, one, one thing that comes to mind is just, um, and this might sound a little bit silly or trite, but the importance of, of uh, sleep and yeah. how that builds into your day. And for me, like if, if I get like on a, like on a good sleep schedule and that's good, like that sets the tone for the entire week. And I realize that that might be a, a strange or an odd example, but just that one thing I, I've noticed that consistently, if I get off of that, 
that affects my workout routine. It affects my eating. It affects uh, everything that I do for the rest of the day. And I think that's, I think it's a good point worth, uh, worth calling out. And it, it, you know, it builds into business as far as uh, how you're going through your day, what you're doing um, with your day and the, and the habits that you build into it. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting call out. Yeah. David, what about you? Well, I think that one of the big lessons is that we can experiment and experiment endlessly, right? I, I think one of the things that we, we take for granted now, for instance, the way that we're communicating with Zoom, nothing fundamentally changed about the technology here with Zoom that prevented us from doing what we're doing now, but we're finding enormous economies of scale from people working at home, telecommuting, not having to to contribute to the pollution and the congestion. These are sort of byproducts of some of our changed habits. And I think that's the result of us trying to figure out how to reconnect and how to reconform to changing situations. So for me, it's about having that freedom of thought and being able to break out of seeing things the way that we used to see things. I think this is an enormously promising period uh, in our history and to be an entrepreneur right now, what a, what a, what a wonderful pursuit. Wow. You're Mr. Optimist. I don't know what to do with myself right now. I feel like the New York (laughs) cynical pain in the ass, but you know what? I'm going to take this Texas good vibe. (laughs) Also have a great idea for the two of you who should become friends because you're both musical. So, um, I, I, you, both of you in your bios mention music. So, um, David, I think it might shock people to learn that your musical taste is not exactly country western, is it? Well, I, I love Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. I mean, you know, Bob Wills is still the king, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. But OK, I might like a little Judas Priest from time to time. And, um, you see, you're you're catching me in my short hair mode. I uh, until f- fairly recently, I was a real long hair. You know, that's oh. another reason I didn't get into business. Right, I didn't have the look. But uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm a rocker at heart. You know, and uh, uh, but aren't we all? And when okay, wait. So, did you discover any new music in the pandemic that you were just excited about and you have to share? You know, I have to say, I, I really got into uh, a lot of electronica and, and EDM and, and stuff like that. Um, and some of it is actually sort of throwback, you know, everything from from Daft Punk, Dirty Vegas, all that kind of stuff, which is now about 20 years old, you know. And, and I feel like I'm sort of putting together a sort of musical vocabulary so that I can appreciate more uh, some of the more modern music. But I've really kind of fallen in head over heels with a lot of electronica and synthesizer uh, uh, music and experimental music. It's just, you know, one of the things that's been difficult for a lot of us during this pandemic has been going to sleep. And so I I got into this jag where I would like sort of explore on Spotify, you know, just looking around for interesting music. And I found that some of it was just so interesting that I would actually stay up much later than I normally would. I think it had the opposite effect of what I intended. I was actually digging deeper and deeper and deeper. So I don't know. I mean, it's it's um, this been a it's been a really interesting period, at least for me. And uh, and and and, you know, I've got my. Got my stereo glowing over there in the corner. And uh, when we get done here, I'm sure I'll be putting on the headphones and and listening some more. So, yeah, I've been really digging deep uh, during the pandemic. All right, Aaron, what is your musical genre of choice and what have you discovered during the pandemic? You know, it's it's we're all over the place. Um, <laughs> I think everything from uh, from classic rock to uh, to modern worship music and kind of everything everything in between. Um, my wife and I sing in our church choir, um, but uh, I'm a little out of now. But uh, played classical violin for many many years. Wow. Um, so, which is <laughs> uh, kind of a little bit out there when you look at the rest of my bio. It doesn't seem to fit very cleanly. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so I, I like a wide variety. I question our, our music pastor's decision in putting me in the choir. I, I don't consider myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we I, have a good I, time, anyways. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, it was funny. Um, I um, uh, just love Dolly Parton. And oh, when I yeah. listen to Dolly Parton's America, which is a great podcast that, you know, it's, people should go check out. I actually went back and listened to a lot of her earlier stuff that I didn't know quite as well. 
And I just couldn't be more delighted. So my rediscovery of Dolly Parton is the one that I think is just sticking with me. I'm bringing it post pandemic. David Brown, Aaron Welker, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me in this after show. Really been a great conversation and look forward to hopefully doing this again sometime soon. Jill, Aaron, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Such a pleasure to do this. Thank you. Small businesses are always looking to educate themselves on the best ways to have meaningful interactions with their consumers. That's why Dell Technologies assembled an all-star lineup of podcasters to create this year's virtual conference to share advice and inspiration for small businesses. Dell Technologies is here. From keeping you connected while working remotely with Windows 10 and Microsoft Teams to providing relevant content for businesses. You can follow all the episodes of the Dell Technologies Podference on the Odyssey app, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. And I want to thank you for joining us all week long for the Dell Technologies Podference After Show. If you'd like to find more participating podcasts like the ones discussed today or any day this week, all you need to do is search for Dell Technologies Podference on the Odyssey app, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts at the end of this episode. You can also check out the Odyssey YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. We'll check in with you next time.